God. Give God some praise. How many of you believe the best is yet to come? Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that you guys are here joining us in person or online right now. We're so glad that you guys are celebrating seven years of life change, seven years of miracles, seven years of seeing God go before us. God is on the move. Amen. I love, I love the, the, the story. I really do. The, all the, the, you got a magazine that has like all the, how many thousands of people committed their life to Christ? I think 13,000, some people, almost 800 baptized. It's crazy. What, but, but, but in the midst of all the numbers, there's stories in your booklet. And we have it online for you to download as well. But there's, that's why we're here. It's the stories. And even as I look out right now um, and see the, the different faces, I, that's what I'm impacted. And every anniversary, it's, it's really hard for me to even preach because it's so amazing. I see the stories of life change, the stories of, of transformation, of people that said yes to God, that said, I'm going all in, of people, even through the seven years of journey of seeing the hurts and the scuffs and the, the, the setbacks, and then you still coming and you pressing in and you not giving up. That's why we're here. We're here to see Jesus lifted high in your life. Come on, can you give God praise one more time, church, if he's been good. Amen. I, I want to begin um, with, sometimes you begin like, some pastors begin with a joke. I want to begin by offending you. Can I do that? I just want to offend you. I think that's a good way to start a message, just to, just to so start it off right, okay? So I was thinking about, thinking about like discovery and who discovery is and what our mission is and who we're called to, to reach. And, and I just, I put together a list and I just, you know, wanted to make sure I, I included you in, in the list. So, so here, here, here's the screen. On the screen, what do you call a group of lying, cheating, greedy, covetous, lustful, Porn watching, tax dodging, racist, jealous, judgmental, lonely, angry, people who eat too much, who spend too much, who drink too much, people who medicate too much, people who worry too much, smoke too much, but who gather together because they love, because they believe Jesus is the light of the world and they need more light. What do you call that? That's the church. That's the church. Okay, and, and, and so if you think, and if I bursted your bubble, you're new to discovering, you're like, oh my gosh, what kind of place did I walk into right now? I didn't mean to burst your bubble, but maybe, maybe it needed to be bursted a little bit, okay? Because the church is not what people think it is, a bunch of perfect people who gather together. If that's what you're looking for, you will never find it. And if you do think you find it, you have found deception. There is no such thing. There isn't, especially when, when, and so when we, dis, we started Discovery Church, I'm not, there you go. When we started Discovery Church, we wanted to reach people who are far away from God, who are far away. And every week, ever since we started, every week where people are committing their life to Christ, they're coming home, they're surrendering every week. So, so here, even if we did, because look, I man, God loves you so much just the way you are, but he doesn't want you to stay there in that place. And neither do I, neither do I. We love you just the way you are. So he doesn't want you to stay in that place. So we take you on a journey of becoming more and more Christ-like. We take you on a journey, journey of discipleship. This faith journey is beautiful, but three years from now, you may not be doing some of that stuff. So, some of you have been here for three years and still doing some of that stuff, okay? Okay, look, that's just real and honest, okay? We're on the journey. But even if you were all, think you got it all figured out and stuff, there was someone today that's given their life to Jesus who, who belongs to the family of God. And if you think that the church is just for cleaned up saints, you got the wrong church. That's not who we are at Discovery. We are a church for the lost, the broken, the hurting, but we don't leave them there. Here, let me give you, let me give you a, a C.S. Lewis said this. It's not in your notes or anything, but he said, of all the bad men, religious bad men are the worst. How I many you know that to be true? You've seen some, some wickedness of religiosity. And so we don't do religion here. We don't do it, man. We are real. We're relaxed. We're relevant here at Discovery Church. Let me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. So we, 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 and this is, I believe this is a message for today in our culture, in our world today. We're so fixated on the wrong things. We're, we're just, we're, we're, we're fixated. We're looking at the wrong things. And here the apostle Paul says, hey, don't get, don't fix your eyes. Don't get focused on this stuff of this world, but fix your eyes on the things that you can't even see. 
He's talking about spiritual eyes, isn't he? Because you can't see with your eyes. He's talking about fix your eyes on things that are unseen. Uh, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And I think today, maybe some of us are, are running so hard in the wrong directions. We're running after the wrong things. We're trying to build a kingdom here on earth, build a life here on earth. So afraid of failure. A lot of us are afraid of failure because of it. But our greatest fear shouldn't be of failure. Our greatest fear should be of succeeding in the things in life that don't really matter. What I want you to understand today is by focusing on this seen world, by focusing on the things of this world, listen to me, church, you're playing into the devil's hands. You're playing right into the enemy's hands if all you are thinking about and focused on is the things of this world. And I don't know if you know it, but the enemy is at work today. He's at work. He, he, the Bible says he, he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking who may, he may devour. Let me, let me give you some insight about the world that we live in, the world that you're so fixated on and focused on and trying to build your life on. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of who? The evil one. Did you know that? That the world that you're living in is actually under the control of the evil one? He's the one in operation in this world. Let me give you some more theology here. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. Because you thought maybe, I don't know what you're thinking about. That you, not, you don't have any enemy at all. Just live your life, live and let live. Maybe you don't know that there's an enemy out there seeking to devour you and your children and God's purpose for your life. The God of this age, second Corinthians says, has blinded the minds of unbelievers who he's in operation just trying to keep your minds from not even seeing the truth of the gospel. Ephesians 2 says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world obeying the devil. The commander of the powers in the unseen world. He says he's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey. So, so today, I, what I want to do is kind of help you see things that, that maybe you're not seeing. I want to open your spiritual eyes today and to have you see something that maybe you're not seeing because of the world that we live in, the culture around us, the things that are being fed to us. Maybe you're not seeing some things, and I've been praying for you all week that some revelation would happen, some light would happen in your spirit, that you would see things the way that God would intend you to see it. But in order to do that, I need to expose some things of the enemy. I want to give you three tactics of the enemy. There's three tactics that he is at work right now in our culture. He's at work in our life to, to pull you to this different realm, to not see the things that God is trying to show you. Let me give you the distractions. Here they are. Write them down if you're taking notes. You should have some in your, in your bag there. You got some pins in there as well. Here's the first tactic, three of them, three tactics of the enemy that he works. Number one is distraction. The enemy wants you distracted from God, distracted from your purpose. And he's at work because if the enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you. And his goal is simple. The enemy's goal, to steal, kill, and destroy. That is the enemy's job description. Look up the definition, distraction, in the dictionary online. It says, distraction can mean three things. To draw away or divert as the mind or attention. The enemy wants you distracted in your mind and your attention or to disturb or trouble greatly in the mind. The enemy wants you so disturbed, so disturbed and distracted by what's going on around you. And here's the third definition, to provide a pleasant diversion, to amuse or to entertain. I'm not sure what you're distracted by today. If you're so disturbed, if you're so kind of restless and anxious, that's a distraction of the enemy. I'm not sure if maybe you've diverted your attention into focusing on the things of this world, or maybe that you're so entertained and focusing on the pleasures of this world, but all of it, listen to me, child of God, that is a distraction and you're playing into the hand of the enemy. Can I get an amen, somebody? Are you listening to me? These are just the tactics, and I'm trying to call you out of darkness into God's marvelous light today. Distractions are designed to get you off course, designed to get you off of God's purpose, and the enemy wants you preoccupied with your situation that you get your eyes focused off of God. You see, the enemy's use, he uses distraction to destroy your purpose. And some of us, we feel so defeated because we're distracted. 
It's not that you have been defeated. You're just so distracted. Some of you are wrestling. You think you're wrestling with God, but in reality, you're wrestling with your distractions. That's not God. I didn't even the devil himself. That's the distraction he put in the way. There's a story of a, Jesus told of a great banquet in Luke chapter 14, and he was talking about really what it was. It was a story about end times and how in the end of all times, God is going to gather everybody to himself. You may know this story. I got one scripture in there or two of them, Luke chapter 14, verse 17 and 18. But the context of it is this, is that Jesus is telling this story of the return. And he says, hey, it's going to come a time where I'm going to call everyone to myself. Come on, I'm ready. Let's, let's feast. Everyone come to the father's house. And, and the Bible says this, that at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all began to make what? Excuses. And the excuses varied too. I just bought, I just bought a field. I got this business going on. I just got married. I have this, I have this, you know, arrangement with my family that's going on. I mean, I'm not, I'm not ready. I can't. Not right now. Now's not a good time. They have all these different excuses, these distractions from not coming to the father's house when he called. Here's what the Bible says in that story continues in verse 21. The servant came back and reported all this to the master. The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets, into the alleys and the towns and bring the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame and everything on that list that I gave you that we began with. All this, all those jacked up, messed up people because them religious Christians, they answer in the call, go get the addicts, go get the people who are prostituted, go get the broke, busted and disgusted and tell them to come to the father's house. The master told his servant, go out to the roads in the country. Actually, he says, sir, uh, sir, the servant said, uh, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. There's still room, God says, in the father's house. And the master told the servant, go out. Somebody say, go out. Go out. go out to the roads and country and lanes and compel them to come in so that my house, here's God's will, that my house will be full. See, this is the command God gave us. Go out into the nation. Make disciples of all nations. This was the command. Go out. Keep going. My house isn't full. How many know heaven isn't full yet? Heaven isn't full yet. And so the command to go out is still stands, which is why at Discovery, we, we are going to continue to reach the lost. That, that, and one of, this is one of, the, one of the things I love about planting a church, starting a church, I have friends who actually took over existing churches that have been in existence 20, 30, 40, 100 years. And they tell me about their problems and I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus, that I didn't take over a church. Because because there's, here, here at Discovery, we prioritize the people who are not in the house. The people who are not here yet, the people who Jesus came to seek and to save, who? The found or the lost? The lost. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. They got so many things going for them. It looks like they have it on the surface, but they don't know God. So, so let's get back to that distraction. The enemy uses distraction, right? But, but if you have your, like, it's not a feeling, but I want you to write a phrase that we say here at Discovery because every... Every phrase of our vision statement, of our purpose statement, actually counteracts the enemy's tactics and plans. Because the enemy wants to distract you from serving God and what we say, that we want to lead people to love God passionately. That's, that's what the enemy wants you to distract. He wants to distract you from your relationship with God, from you prioritizing your life as a God first life where other things just take the place. And so we are going to continue to go out and fill the Father's house. So I'm really excited to announce the next five campuses that Discovery is going to launch. The next five campuses, here they are. We're actually going after the, the Central Valley of California, the key targeted areas, not only Bakersfield, but we're going to launch in Los Angeles, Fresno, Sacramento, and San Francisco. These are the places in the Central Valley that we're going to be launching next. Why? Because there's room in the Father's house. That's why. And then you see San Antonio, Texas there. We're actually sending Pastor Jeff Spates, who is a pastor here at Discovery. He has moved already to San Antonio in Texas, and we'll be starting that church soon. If you actually want to move to Texas, I mean, like, get me out of California, let me know. Hey, now's your time. Come on. Are you all talk or what? Yeah, yeah. 
I hate California. I'll move to Texas. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Let's go. There's work to be done. All right. So you let me know. You want to still move to Texas, huh? Amen. Okay. Here's the other. Let me give you the, this is the, how the enemy works. Tactics. Distraction. Write this one down. Division. We live in a divided world, don't we? And the enemy seeks to, to draw the lines and the distinctions and put us versus them. And, and whether it's political parties or religious affiliations or personalities or whatever differences, the enemy's work is to not only distract, but to divide, to divide and conquer. But Ephesians tells us, church, our struggle is not against them. It's not us versus them. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities like we're talking about. It's that prince of power, the air. It's, the, it's the, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. It's very odd to me. I hear people talk about the church like it's some institution, like it's a thing you go to or an event or some another program or a thing to be a part of rather than a group of people. The church, that's what the church is. It's, it's the people. And sometimes, you, maybe you've said this, but I, the, the, so, sometimes I'll hear, the church ought to do this. The church ought to do that. The church ought to do this. You know, we should do something about that. My favorite, my favorite one is someone tells me, well, Pastor, we need to take a stand on this. Hey, Pastor Jason, why don't we take a stand on this one? Hey, we should take a, a stand here. My friend told me, they said, hey, Jason, generally speaking, you know, when people tell you to take a stand, they're usually telling you to take their stand. And so, so now when people say, hey, I think Pastor Jason, Pastor Jason, I think we should take a stand. I like to answer, whose stand? Your stand or just, or any stand? <laughs> whose stand? Okay, because, and, and they'll want, they'll want like, oh, you, we should really, you know, take a stand, Pastor. But here's the deal. You need to know this. A lot of you know this already, but if you don't, you need to know this. I'm not the church. I'm not the church. We are the church. We, the body of Christ, we are the church. Besides that, the church is in a place where you agree on everything. That's right. The church is a group of diverse people with diverse beliefs and personality, very imperfect people. That's why you weren't offended by my list because you found your name on that list. <laughs> Woo! The church is a gathering of imperfect people with different views different experiences who really don't agree on everything, but that doesn't mean that we can't walk in unity. First Corinthians chapter one, Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority. Here's the why. The why should we have unity? Because the authority of Jesus Christ compels us. That's the why, because of Jesus, by the authority of Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, that doesn't mean we should all think, the li think alike, talk alike, and, and look alike, and believe alike. No, what he's talking about there is being united in the purposes of God. And here's, here's how we say it at Discovery. To what? Love God, love each other, and change the world. So what's the answer for division? The, 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 the tactic of the enemy? Love each other, church. Stop bickering against each other. Hey, but Jesus said this. This is how they're going to know you're my disciples. This is by your love for one another. They're going to know that you're not of this world. Stop allowing the enemy. Stop playing into the enemy's hand. You're fixated on the wrong things. Don't let the enemy divide us. Love each other authentically. Here's the, so he distracts us. He divides us. Here's the third thing. Delusion. Dilution, dilution, however you want to say that. Dilution, dilution. What is, what is dilution? It's the act of making something weaker in force, content, or value. So this is another tactic of the enemy. And maybe he's been at work in your life in, in one or more of these. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is checking you today. That maybe you've been distracted. Maybe you've lost focus. You're fixated on the wrong things. Or maybe you've allowed division to happen. And us versus them, you started taking a stand for something or for someone. Or, or, or maybe it's this one where you've become weaker. You've become less in force or value. Where, where, where the things of God, your purpose, why you're here, 
little by little, you know, maybe you were once on fire for God, but little by little, you just, ah, this is going to be okay. This is okay if I do this, and it's okay if I, if I try that, and it's okay. And, and uh, I mean, I'm not called to be a pastor or anything, so it's okay if I, and little by little, you fell into the enemy's hand, deluded, weaker. Another decision, delusion, weaker. Revelation chapter two. We're actually going to be studying this, and I'm going to show you later. We're going to do a deep dive in Revelation later. Yet I hold this against you. This is a revelation of the apostle John, Jesus speaking. He says, you've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you first did before you diluted yourself before you allowed compromises to take place in your faith and in your walk and in your family, in your relationships, in your purity. We've deluded ourselves. So what's the answer? Love God, <laughs> love each other. Well, the answer for the delusion is get back to doing what God has called you to do. Get back to making a difference. Get back, to, get, go, get back to being a change agent for God. Go out and compel them to come. Recognize your mission. All the other things in this life, in this world, that you try to do and you are doing, and you go for it, do some things, man. Be a, pal, be a part of some things. That's okay. But don't let it supersede the mission of God that he has called you to, to make a difference in this world for the kingdom of God. Amen? I love how the message translation says that verse that we were began on 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. The message paraphrase says, there is far more here than meets the eye. Come on, somebody. There is far more here than meets the eye. I love that. And when I was reading this verse, I thought of the current climate that we're in. There's that, that some of us may be playing into the enemy's hand because we think that... Um, this is the season we're in is like a pause. It's a hold. We're not where we used to be and we're not where we're going. And we're in this middle nowhere ground. And I'm here to tell you today, there is far more here than meets the eye. This isn't just another seven year anniversary. This isn't just another service. I, I believe something very prophetic is happening in the world today. I believe something prophetic is even happening at discovery. That seven years is, is the year of of completion, seven. And I believe God is doing, he's, he's completing some things, that he's tying up some things, and there is a new thing he wants to do, a new beginning that God wants. And eight in the Bible, eight is the year of new beginnings, of fresh starts. God wants to do something new. He wants to, and so there is far more here than meets the eye. Things that we see now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. I was thinking about the, the story of, of Jacob. Jacob is one of my favorite characters in the Bible just because of his life and, his, and how messed up this dude was and still God loved him and ran after him, man. And it just, I see myself in Jacob a lot because, because of how messed up maybe he is. I don't know, but I love the story of Jacob. And, and I was thinking about this, this where we're at and how there's more than meets the eye and how we need to fix our eyes on things that are not seen, on the unseen and not on the seen. And, and I thought about this word, and I want to share you a few thoughts about, about Jacob's life. In Genesis chapter 28, and I'm just going to summarize some things, give you a few verses, but I'd love for you to read Genesis chapter 28. Maybe even Jacob's story expands quite a few chapters in Genesis. But Jacob had just betrayed his father, stolen the birthright, the blessing, he betrayed Esau, took advantage of him when he was weak and took his, his birthright for some beans. And it was just, man, he was, this dude, Jacob was ruthless, man. Uh, he was just a swindler, Jacob was. So he messed up his family relationships. And now in Genesis chapter 28, he's on the run. He's running from, now Abraham is his dad. He's running from the promised land that God had prophesied of God, that Abraham was his. He's running from that, and he's going back to his homeland. He's going backwards. He's going to Laban's house because he done messed up his relationships. 
He made too many bad decisions. Anyone can sympathize with this, that you've made too many bad decisions and you mess up some stuff and you say, you know what, I gotta get out of here because I don't wanna face the consequences of this or I've just, I gotta cut this off or maybe they cut me off, whatever. I gotta go back. I can't stay here. And so Jacob is on his way to Laban's house and he just finds this place of rest. He's in this, he's in between the promised land and, and Laban's house, his is where he's, his ancestors have come from. And really, it's just this nowhere place. It's nowhere. It's, it's, it's got like, it's, there's nothing there in this place. And he puts a rock down and sleeps, takes a nap on the rock in the middle of nowhere. And God visits Jacob. And God tells him, I'm for you, Jacob. You can run, but you can't hide. You can run, but you can't hide. I'm for you, Jacob. I'm gonna do something great in your life. And let me just read this verse, Genesis 28, 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Surely the Lord was in this place, and I wasn't aware that God wanted to do something in the middle of nowhere. I love this about God. See, God doesn't wait for you to get to a place called there. God doesn't wait for you to get to a place called finished. God doesn't wait for you to get to the place that you're running to, the destination of, of how good you think you should be or how much you should measure up or, or whatever finish line that you're calling a finish line. God doesn't wait for you to get to a place called there, but he meets Jacob in the middle of nowhere. And Jacob goes, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it, that God was here. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the Father's house, the house of God in the middle of nowhere with no building, with no roof. He said, this is the gate of heaven. How many of you know you're in the Father's house right now? You're in the Father's house. And I don't, maybe you're not aware that there's so much more here than meets the eye. And maybe you're just not aware that God wants to meet you here. Let me give you a few thoughts about this this scripture and this story. Number one, you can't run from your purpose. You can't run from your purpose. See, God is the great pursuer. He runs after you. See, God searched for Adam and Eve in the garden. God went after Cain. God sought and found Abraham. God is the one who plucked David from the field, tending sheep, and appointed him as king. God is the one who found Gideon in a wine press, thinking he was nothing. God is the great pursuer. Even when Jonah, when Jonah wants to run and tries to run and hide and hide from his purpose, God finds him. God will find you and call an uber whale to get you where you need to be. <laughs> Spit you out in the place where you belong, okay? God, you cannot run from your purpose. And someone is here today that's been running. You've been distracted. You've been allowing none of the things of this world to both distract, divide, or to loot. But today, God is telling you, you can't run from your purpose, Jonah. You can't hide from your purpose, Jacob. I've called you, and I have a purpose for your life. Look at Romans chapter 8. says, for he knew all. God knew all about us before we were born. And even then, before you ever messed up, before you ever broke that relationship, before you ever made that bad decision, he does in us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. I'm here to tell you today, listen, church, if you start right where you are, God will take you where you need to be. You say, but I'm in the middle of nowhere. No, 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 God, surely he's in this place. Oh, but I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. No, 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 no. You don't need to be there. God wants to meet you. You're just not aware of it. He wants to meet you right here. You can't run from your purpose. Number two. Your mistakes don't prevent God's promises. Your mistakes don't prevent. He, God can turn your mistakes into a miracle, church. If you're willing, man, regardless of any mistake you have made, the tragedy that has come in your life, if you will turn to God, he is prepared to turn your mistakes, your awful circumstance, to turn it into a miracle. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 says, Whenever our hearts make us feel guilty... One translation says, whenever our hearts condemn us, 
You may be listening to Satan and still feeling condemned and guilty for your mistakes and your failures. He wants to remind us of our failures. Here's what it says. We know that God is much greater and more merciful than even our own conscience. And he knows everything. Say that with me. One, two, three. He knows everything. He knows everything there is to know about us. And he chose you anyway. And he loves you anyway. Your mistakes do not take away or counteract the promises of God. In this story, Jacob was messed up, jacked up, betrayer. That's who he was. That's what his name means, even deceiver. And God shows up and tells him, you cannot run from who I've called you to be. In the story, Jacob is like a type and a shadow. I want you to know this about God because what we live in right now, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, what was attributed to Jacob, he did not deserve it. It was because of someone else's obedience that God attributed favor and blessing to Jacob. Listen, he's a type. Jacob, if you are here today and Jesus is your Lord and Savior, no matter where you at or how many mistakes you have made, what has been attributed to you is not based upon how, much, how you measure up, but based upon the obedience of Jesus Christ, that he died on a cross for you, was raised from the dead. And so no matter where you're at, God looks at you in your middle of nowhere, and he says, God, God has a purpose for your life. You cannot run from your purpose, and your mistakes don't prevent God's promises. Here's number three. I want you to know God will meet you in the middle of nowhere. God wants to meet you in the middle of your nowhere, man. I think about that word nowhere. Like that word, some of you feel like, and I put it, there you go. Some of you feel like you're nowhere. Some of you feel like you've ran so far away from God and you've made too many mistakes and you're nowhere. But listen to me, please. You're, you're fixated on the wrong things. You're not seeing things, right? You're not aware of some things kind of like Jacob in the middle of his nowhere. But if you would just fix your eyes, on the unseen instead of the seen. If you, there is far more here than meets the eye. If you would just shift your perspective, God can turn your nowhere into, oh my gosh, God is, so this isn't nowhere. God is now here. And I wasn't aware of it. If you just shifted, you see what I did there with that word? Did you see what I did there? Okay. I hope you see what I did there. This is nowhere but all it takes is a shift of your perspective, a shift of what you're looking at or maybe how you're looking at it. Maybe you're not aware of it, but God wants to meet you in the middle of nowhere. And after God met Jacob, recognized that it wasn't nowhere and God was now here. It says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me. And I love how it puts the disclosure. Jacob is still jacked up. Jacob's like conditionally talking to God. Okay, God, okay, God, if, if God will be with me and will watch over me my journey and, I, and I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so I can return safely to my father's house. This is Jacob's just... I love, look, he still messed up. He's just conditional, okay? He's like, okay, if God, if you're gonna do your part, I'm gonna do my part. But God will, God's not offended by you when you messed up, when you're thinking wrong. He'll, he'll, he'll start wherever you are and take you wherever you need to be. So he's like, okay, God, if you're gonna do that, then the Lord will be my God. This is the first time that Jacob has ever declared God is my God. Never before has he said, my God. It was always, my father is God. Now he says, okay, no, the Lord's gonna be my God. And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth God. This was a practice that his dad used to do. His dad practiced tithing and giving a tenth. And so Jacob says, okay, if this is, if this is real and you're really God, okay, you're gonna be my God now. At some point in your walk, you gotta stop relying on yesterday's blessings on your father or your name or your money or whatever it is. You gotta make a decision for yourself that the Lord is gonna be your God. And you're gonna put him in the rightful place that he belongs. So what do you do today? Give God control of your life and go all in. That's what Jacob did. Give God control of your life. Are you not aware of it? This isn't time to pause. This isn't time to, to just take a break on, on life, on your marriage, on your spiritual development, on your walk with Jesus. This isn't, no, no, no. Give God control and go all in. Maybe you're here today and you need to do that because you've been distracted. Maybe you're watching online and you've allowed the distraction of the enemy 
or division or even dilution to happen and you're a watered down version of what you used to be. Come on, I'm sorry to offend you, but that's just the way it is. That's, and today, God's meeting you in the middle of your messed up choices, messed up decisions, in the middle of your nowhere. God is now here. He's here. Can I pray for you? Every head bow, every eye closed right now, even online. If you're listening, watching, you're here today. I don't know if, the, if you've played into the enemy's tactics and what tactics have, have, have kind of taken effect in your life, but today I wanna give you an opportunity to give God control, to maybe give it over again to him and go all in with God. Like give him everything, every part of your life. Give him control. That's what salvation is to give God control and go all in. Now, if that's you and you're ready to, to, you're ready for a fresh start, you're ready to give God control of your life, whether you're online or here today, you can click a button online when I'm about to count to three right now or just say, I'm going all in right in the chat right now. But with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm not gonna have you come up to the front. I want you right where you are, if you're ready to go all in with God, on the count of three, to lift up a high, bold hand. One, two, three, come on, I'm going all in with God. Yes, all over this place, all over this place, online, type it in the chat. I'm going all in with God. I'm giving God control of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are here. And I wasn't aware of it. You're in the middle of my mess, and I wasn't aware of it. God, you're here. Thank you, God. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this? Say, Jesus, I give you control of my life, and I'm going all in. I declare, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. Today, come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, change me from the inside out. No longer will I be distracted, divided, or deluded, but I'm gonna fulfill the purpose that you have called me to by your power at work within me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise in the house and online today.